Eye on Education, I'm Fred Martino. Up front this week, art and education come together in Carterville. We are thrilled to present this documentary provided by John A. Logan College. It's called Untitled, The Art of Alden Addington. What I've got is what I work with, and uh, you know I treat uh, a, a scrapyard, a salvage yard, as my art supply store, and so uh, what I find there determines what I make. Because otherwise, if I had to buy all this stuff out of a catalog, uh, each piece would have to be a masterpiece, and they would all be on a pedestal scale because the material itself is so expensive. And if I decide that uh, something isn't going to make it at all, and it's it's just more scrap, then it still has value. You know, even the even the pieces that fail still have the intrinsic value of the metal. Well, you know, sometimes I'm digging back into stuff that I bought 20 years ago, and so uh, I look at things and reevaluate them. You know, I'm like the guy on the beach looking for coconuts, you know, and you find a pile of coconuts and then you start doing something with them, you know, and, and so I'm always looking for coconuts, you know, or whatever, you know, we're always looking for something, you know. I, I try to avoid titles as much as possible because I feel that titles tend to tell people what to look at or what they're looking at or what to think about what they're looking at, and I prefer they just figure that all out on their own. So. I make the pieces, I don't explain them. We're having all of our students, all of our welding students, our construction management students, our art students, they're all coming together to help on this project. We are blending the comprehensiveness of what we teach here on campus and, and putting it together to help create these beautiful spaces that we can see this art. And it's important to have um, administration be as excited about that and understand the, the cultural importance, the aesthetic importance, and the community importance. So, I, I feel really grateful that we are that we're moving in this direction. Well, I see these pieces as being really centerpieces for a lot of different things that our students can do. For one, they're going to be placed in really, really neat places. Uh, it'd be a peaceful place for people to go and sit around and, and just do their writing, meet with other students, have a cup of coffee, uh, just look at the piece, really enjoy that, right? But then I think our 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 folks in our programs, like our English program or our writing program, they can send them out to get inspiration from the pieces and bring it back to their classroom. My experience will be sort of two different elements because my art appreciation class, we actually talk about sculpture, we talk about the materials, um, the assemblage method, and the different materials that can come together. And then there's my art history class. And after interviewing Alden and Alden talking about the artists that inspired him, they're all artists that we talk about in class. And to think that after, you know, they see these artists that inspired Alden and then to see someone from our community and how they were inspired by the materials and experienced by that body of work and, you know, what, what he created. It's, you know, each experience, each class that goes out there will be a different experience, but they're both very exciting. You've figured out what you want to tell young art students, then 
those are things that you have to have accumulated through some sort of experience or uh, research or something. You can't just get up there and read a script. You've got to actually show people what's going on. And so I found that if I could do an adequate job of expressing the possibilities for materials and what you could do with the materials, how to use the materials, and you know how to how to use machinery to make things that that these passing that information on was about as important as anything I could do and I enjoyed that. You know one of the exciting things about having Alden's work here on campus is the way that Alden as an artist visualizes his own pieces. When I look at his artwork I can see the elements that he is choosing to integrate, and I can also see that he allows the viewer to experience their own ideas about things. I had 15 years of construction, so the first time I saw Alden's pieces over at his place, it was this like blend in my heart of all of the things that I've done in my lifetime. So he has some really, really neat pieces on his, on his campus over at, at, in Carbondale. Some of them look like, uh, they look like pipe. And, and when I was in construction, when I was an electrician, uh, I was up underneath bridges putting this pipe together, right? And looking at the pipe, it just gave me this inspiration of where I came from. This art project's been really good for the welding program and the construction management and art. You know, all the students are getting to work together along with the instructors to figure out how to design, build, and install the artwork you know, on John A. Logan property. Whenever he said that uh, my teacher Grover had asked, like, you know, would you be willing to help? I was like, heck yeah. So uh, I came up to the school and I met Alden and um, we went about basically putting it back together. And then uh, we actually ended up adding some more pieces to it to bolster it, to kind of thicken it up some and, and to make it a little bit more uh, uh, robust and structurally sound as it were but it was a uh, it was a really nice and cool experience to have the art here and to be you know how it was constructed and the fact that he had put it together the way he did i mean it it's showing another aspect that it's not just a dirty grimy job that you know that you know it's a necessity for for you know you know modern society that you can actually end up creating things that our art and you know it's really nice that we actually have something that represents our field here on campus now. I think one of the things that I uh, you know might take away from this is one that there's so many awesome careers that can come from welding uh, and I myself would like to continue along the metal path as it were. I would like to eventually go to SIU they have a metal smith program and uh, eventually, you know, become a teacher myself. Essentially, it's limitless. It's really the only thing that basically is gonna hold you up is your imagination, and I have a vast imagination. If you really wanna make art, you'll figure out a way to do it, you know, and you'll figure out that that's more important than some other things. So you have to make decisions all along, and sometimes if you just decide that, by golly, I'm an artist and I'm going to keep making art, uh, you'll figure out a way to do it or not. You know? And joining me now in studio, the artist in that documentary, Alden Addington. Alden, thank you so much for being with us today. Happy New Year. It is great to have you with us. I so enjoyed uh, watching uh, that video and watching you at work. Uh, and the experience of working with students at John A. Logan College, uh, not just uh, art students, but there's welding students, construction students, uh, installing the sculptures on campus. What did you think of that process? I was amazed at the whole process. It turned into a seminar on Egyptian construction methods where you have a lot of people 
intent on doing something and it happens right there before your eyes. And so uh, we unloaded the piece from the trailer, the 20 foot sculpture that's now installed. And it was amazing just to see it on top of all these students' shoulders as it headed over to the spot where it was finally installed. It was, it was amazing. It just, it, while I was standing there trying to figure out what we were going to do, it happened. It's unbelievable. So uh, it's a great crew over there, and they, they, they jump in and they do what needs to be done. I'm sure a lot of people watching that will be inspired seeing it. And to me, it really seemed like a model for getting more students involved in the arts, if not uh, personally involved, learning about art and the process and appreciating the arts. Well, those folks are learning all sorts of skills related to the particular area that they're interested in. But <clears throat> I think what, what they learned uh, from participating in this project was that if they all got together and cooperated, they could do incredible things. And I think that's the way it went. It was, you know, I was thinking in terms of heavy equipment and things like that necessary to do what needed to be done. But they just all jumped in and did it. You mentioned in the video that uh, you used material from salvage in your, uh, in your sculpture. Repurposed. Repurposed. Repurposed, yeah. If architects redo a building for something else, they, they, they don't start with junk, they start with repurposing. That's what I did. I repurposed materials from, from our industrial society. And the reason for that mainly was economics. Because if I order a 20 foot piece of stainless steel, it's going to cost a fortune. <laughs> By the time it's shipped to me, every piece that, that I used that, uh, that initial uh, shipment for would have to be a masterpiece. And they would all probably be about two foot high. Yeah. You know, but if you're scrounging around recycling material, you know, you can, you can find gems and you put those gems together to make what you want to make. That sounds like it gets to my question that, you know, some people might look at using repurposed stuff as a limiting factor. No, But no. others would say, no, it's, no, an ex no. it's not well, at all. Here, you get ideas the, from it, maybe, the right? Basic, the basic rule that I follow is that I don't use anything that had a useful life uh, as something else. I don't use things that are readily identifiable as gears or or other other parts of something, things with bolt holes in them, things that have been welded. I use the stock. I, I use the what the shops call those things drops. When they cut a piece with the, with a saw and the piece that drops down on the floor yeah. is you know, tossed in, in the bin to yeah. be recycled. So you thought you needed 20 feet, but you had, you only needed 18, two feet drop off. Oh yeah, there you exactly. Go. Okay, good. And, and so that- and there's nothing wrong with that piece that wasn't used to make whatever was made. And yeah. I would imagine having to use material maybe from several different sources, as opposed to being a limiting factor, it might give you ideas. It no, gives me thing, ideas. Yeah. I'm the guy on the beach picking up coconut <laughs> shells, you know. Uh, Mosquito Coast is one of my favorite movies, you know. Yeah. Uh, so the idea being that the things that you need and can use, you can find, mm -hmm. you know. And, and the interesting thing about using salvage materials is you go to the scrapyard and you see something there, you probably should grab it right then because it probably won't be there the next day or the next week. Yeah, you probably learned that by experience, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's not an art supply store where things are on shelves and like that. You go in there and you dig it out of the pile and it's your treasure and you throw it in your truck and you, know, you, you collect that with all the other stuff you've collected and you find a way to make things. I see a little smile, a little light in your eyes. You're talking about that. This sounds like this is part of the fun. Well, this is sadly, part of the fun, right? Sadly, that's something that's kind of gone away because I've only located one 
uh, recycling facility in the area that will allow me in and sell me things. Oh, okay. And that's up at Newton, Illinois. They've got a little shop or a little operation up there that, that uh, stays open three or four days a week. And I can call ahead and make sure they're there and uh, they'll sell me whatever I want. But the price has quadrupled since, you know, I had Gary's Metals over at Carterville, you know. So, you know, metal prices have gone way up and particularly stainless steel because it has all of those neat things in it like chromium and nickel that are quite expensive and getting rarer, more rare all the time. So, so uh, my material has gone up in price and the intrinsic value has increased. And that's something else about working with, with the, particularly with stainless steel. It always has an intrinsic value. So if you end up with your own scrap pile, you know, it still has a value. You know, you don't throw it away, you yeah. recycle it. You, you mentioned uh, in the video, and of course it's part of the title of the video, untitled, uh, that you do not name your works. Well, tell usually, me, usually, tell, usually, usually tell me about that decision and well, how it came the, about. When did it happen? Is, I, 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 I haven't strictly uh, refused to put titles on things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, uh, in agreement with you know wherever the piece is going to finally be installed, I come to uh, a, a satisfactory agreement with the folks that okay, we'll call it this or that. You know, but mostly. I don't put titles on it because I have the feeling that if I put a title on something, then I'm telling the viewer how to, how to look at it and what to think about it. Mm -hmm. And I would prefer that people just see the thing and you know, come to their own conclusions. Yeah. And the thing is, with a totally abstract piece, you can see different things different times, but yeah. if you see, uh, a horse, for example, is always going to be a horse. But you know, if it's if it's a collection of materials that are reacting to the atmosphere and 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 the time of day and all of that, then the thing is totally changing all the time. Yeah. When did you make that decision? Was it very oh, early, early on? Your I never, I never, I never liked hanging titles on things. Okay. And so I always felt that I'd I'd let the viewer decide what they were looking at. I enjoyed hearing you talk about that and now expanding on it in this, in this conversation. We also notice in this video that you have art in your yard, uh, on your home. Your home itself is actually yeah. an art project. Tell me about that decision and then the reaction in the neighborhood when you decided to do this. Oh, well, you know, I built the house in the neighborhood with the material from this local scrapyard. And I was able to find things that I could cut apart and reuse to make, uh, well, the house is nine foot up in the air. So, because it's a floodplain mm -hmm. that, that I live in. And so I thought it might be a good idea to you know, elevate it. <laughs> so I found some uh, units that were manufactured especially for Ford Motor Company to enable them to haul engine blocks on railroad flat cars. And so I saw these things and I thought, I can use those things, I can build something with those. And so I just bought the entirety of the, I don't know, 180 some that they had. And <clears throat> I asked the guys in the office if they would deliver them for me. This is a scrapyard. They don't usually offer delivery services, but they brought the total 184 out, out to my lot over in the northeast section of town and just dumped them off in a big <laughs> pile. They were all Ford blue and people were wondering what in the world's going on. But I had a neighbor in the, in the, uh, down at the end of the street who had worked construction. He understood how to build things. And so I explained to him, I had a model of what I wanted to do. I showed him the model and explained what I wanted to do. And, and he understood that. And he was able to be my ambassador in the, in the neighborhood. And he explained exactly what I was going to be doing with all that material. So they knew right from the beginning that I wasn't going to put in a car wash or something like that. <laughs> you know, because the thing is, you have a construction crew out there. They're not wrestling uh, steel pipes around. 
they're they're you know it's hammer and nails and boards you know mm -hmm. but but uh, uh, you know in the beginning they were a little bit curious about what was going on but once they saw that I was welding the whole thing together and they knew that I could weld then and had welding equipment there then all sorts of things came to me people would drag their broken lawn mowers and whatnot by <laughs> and so you know I I was I was then you know not some suspect individual from outside. I was one of them. I could yeah. stick on more parts together if they were broken. <laughs> I could do all sorts of things. So they like wanted that. to actually donate stuff to you to actually expand your that, work. That happened too. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Um, you say in the video, I like this too, that if you really want to make art, you're going to figure it out. Uh, you work with a lot of students over three decades of teaching at Southern Illinois University Carbondale. Do you have a story that you can remember, a favorite story of a student who figured it out in your class? I'm sure you, you have know, many, but. The house project mm -hmm. was a time when I was able to work with a lot of former students. I always worked with people that had taken my class. I never ever worked with a student that was going to get a grade from me. So uh, uh, I kept track of the comings and goings of a lot of those students, and they know where the house is. They worked on the house, and they come by to see what's going on with the house. And they, you know, they they tell me on the internet that they, when they're in town, they come by to see what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, so I've kept up with 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 a lot of those students, and they've without exception, done something in the arts. They may be working in a commercial foundry or doing something else to keep the lights on, but they make their art. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is that they want to do, they've figured out ways to do it. Do you have a, a favorite example of a student that might have been in your class and not really sure about how they were going to express themselves in the arts but they, fi they figured it out in your class. Well, I don't know that any of them had an epiphany in my class, uh -huh. but you know, the, the, the experience of going through the program in, in the art school, and we've got a lot of really innovative things going on uh, in, in the fine arts, and they, they, they came through the program, they may have decided at some point they wanted to be in some particular program mm -hmm. and by the time they got through they had a totally different idea of what they wanted to do so uh, you know it was it was a magic when I came to this school everything in the world was going on here this was the center of the country and the word got out that you you could come to this school uh, you know, where everything was going on, you'd be 300 miles away from mom and dad. They wouldn't be dropping in on the weekend <laughs> un unannounced. And so you could come down here and, you know, it was a magical place. We had uh, incredible uh, things going on in athletics. Buckminster Fuller was here. There was lots and lots of stuff going on. And and this this place was, was just magical. It's is incredible. You walk cross campus and there's Bucky Fuller under a tree with 20 students, you know, and then you walk back later and there's 40 students, you know, so it, there was magical things going on around it here. It must have been so wonderful. Well, tell me, uh, you know, I wanted to ask you about that, the magic of art and, uh, you know, unfortunately, as you know, a lot of public uh, schools for younger students have cut art programs how do you think uh, parents can help fill the void when, when well, there isn't an exposure that's, to art? That's unfortunate. You know, we've, we've been making things ever since we started, you know, stuff on the cave wall, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, we, we haven't figured out totally why, why that was done, but it was an important part of what was going on, and that's been going on for a long, long time. As long as somebody's not starving, they think about decorating the cave wall or something yeah. of that sort. And and uh, you know, uh, it's 
it's it goes way back. You know, those places like Stonehenge and and uh, Gobeki Tepe and those those places where people were were using rocks to shape rocks. You know, it was that was an important thing. And and the notion that art is some kind of frill that you may or may not need. You know, I, I don't agree with that notion at all. We've always been artists, and you know we'll always continue to be artists. And the notion that you know making art is something that's not essential is just—it's silliness. You know? Well put, well put, and a good way to conclude our educate our talk today on the importance of arts and the importance of it in education. Alden, thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. It's been great having you here with us. I appreciate it. And thank you for being with us as well. My guest was local artist Alden Addington. That is Eye on Education for everyone at WSIU. I'm Fred Martino. Thanks for joining us. Have a great week.